How we remember and portray the past is deeply consequential for the present. How we represent cultures matters, and it matters not just to academics. Representation is always a deeply political act that has real world consequences, and in some cases, deadly ones. The way cultures and groups are represented in school, media, fiction, and nonfiction books, movies, and even cartoons has the potential to humanize or dehumanize them. Learning about the cultural other can become a means to build intercultural solidarity, empathy, and mutual understanding, or as we've seen too often in history, it can prepare the ground for some of the most horrific human actions and institutions, such as racism, colonialism, and war. This is one of the main reasons why what we're doing here today matters. In a highly politicized environment, we as scholars of Persian culture need to constantly be on guard against distortions and misrepresentations of Iran and Persian history and culture. We must fight back against the pseudo histories, pernicious cultural narratives, and fake news that together form a formidable propaganda campaign against Iran. In practical terms, what, what am I talking about here? So I'm just show a few examples here. Uh, if you read any newspaper in the US, you're probably familiar with pictures like this of Iran, typically large crowds dressed in dark colors with the obligatory death to America, the Magba Amrika in the background, um, cultural, popular cultural um, things such as the movie 300, who my colleagues here who work on that time period could do a far better job of than, than me debunking. Um, or even cartoons, like this well-known cartoon uh, that, was, that came out depicting Iran, Iranians as cockroaches that were infecting the rest of the Middle East, of course, with the kind of natural assumption that what needs to happen to them is to be exterminated. Um, but these are just some examples. Um, we could add many more to the list, reading Lolita in Tehran, Not Without My Daughter, even The Kite Runner, to say nothing of the even, evening news most nights. Despite their considerable differences, what these mirrored examples share is a certain visual vocabulary and an overwhelming focus on Iran and Persian culture as a culture of death, destruction, and oppression. In a short presentation such as this, I obviously cannot delve into and present a corrective for each of these examples. But what I would like to do is present a cultural counterpoint of this culture of death narrative by focusing on a school of thought in medieval Persian Sufism that regarded the cosmos as a great love affair. One could tell the story of the Sufi school of love through many different examples. The opening slide here, uh, oops, sorry, I got kind of ahead there. The opening slide here portrays the great Sheikh Sanan and the beautiful Christian maiden that he fell so madly in love with that he left his powerful religious position in Mecca to follow her, eventually going so far as to convert to Christianity out of love for her. The story's a bit more complicated, but one could also use the example of Yusuf and Zuleha, who both Rumi and Ainul Gozat cite in their discussions of the power of love. But the example that I want to focus on here is drawn from the hagiography of the famous 13th century Persian Sufi poet and theorist Fakhreddin Araki. I want to focus on Araki's story for two reasons. First, he played a crucial role in the development of medieval Persian love theory with his fusion of the older path of love Sufism with the Neoplatonic metaphysical system of Ibn Arabi. And secondly, and more importantly, his story is more interesting, is more interesting because it features not heterosexual lovers, um, as in the case of these previously mentioned examples, but rather same-sex lovers. His case is a good illustration of the fact that homoerotic desire itself was considered normative in the pre-modern Islamic world, even if not illicit, legally speaking, to act upon. So according to his hagiography, and I'm going to go to an image here that uh, is a, uh, oops, that um, a few scenes from his hagiography from a few different manuscripts. Araki was, by a young age, an unparalleled teacher of the traditional Islamic sciences. Everyone marveled at his piety. But this all changed one day in an instant when a wild band of antinomian rogues called Qadandars burst into the madrasa where he was teaching. They disrupted everything with their wild singing and dancing. As they sang one of their rogue ditties praising antinomianism and love, Araki's eye caught the sight of a beautiful young Qadandar youth, a young male. Something happened in that moment to Araki that would change him forever. The account says that Araki was overtaken, seized, transformed, but by what exactly? Despite some scholarly attempts to straighten this account in various ways by removing the gender component, the original Persian account is exceedingly clear. 
It is the beauty of the young Kalandar male who ravished Aralke's heart. So intense is this love that Aralke abandons his positions and family in Hamadan and follows the Kalandars to India. This love story, unfortunately, does not have a happy ending. Aralke eventually loses his beloved Kalandar in a storm near on the route to Delhi. However, as the account goes, this experience of love forever transformed Aralke. Aralke would go on not only to become one of the leading poets and theorists of love in the Sufi tradition, but also he became famous, or infamous in some quarters, for his seemingly unending search for new lovers. Wherever he went throughout the remainder of his life, and he traveled widely from India to Anatolia and Egypt, he fell in love with one new young man after the next. These young lovers were not, were not lovers in the carnal sense. For Aralki and the Sufi lover par excellence, they were meditative objects in which he was able to see the divine beauty of God embodied and thereby reignite those flames of love that were first kindled in that life-transforming encounter with the young Kalandar youth. This practice of employing earthly beauties of either sex, but often male, for this ritualistic excitation of love became known as Shahed Bazi. But it was part of a much broader theoretical framework that championed the physical experience of earthly love as a prerequisite for, or at least an unparalleled aid in, the development of love for God and the realization of true reality, and reality here with a capital R. This leads me to a poem by Araki that I want to share with you. According to his hagiography, Araki was inspired to compose this poem by the beauty of another one of his beloveds, Hassan the singer. It in many ways is a poetic summary of the Sufi theory of love that we have been discussing. And I'm not going to read through the whole poem um, just because of time limits. Uh, I'll give you my reading of the poem and you can kind of read it as we look at it together here. The poem begins with the cosmic pre-eternal image of love bringing the nine spheres of the universe in motion, searching. Love here is what might be called the necessary existence in, the, in philosophical terminology, and it does not just create the world, but brings the whole universe into a dance. The created world is only an echo, a veiled version of love's song, but within, within it there is a hidden secret that the conoscenti can discover. The second section of the poem centers on the sharp yet subtle re rebuttal to the critics of this theoretical framework. In particular, Araki is trying to defend this school of thought's approach to, approach to and use of embodied beauty, the so-called fair-faced beautiful idols of lines six and nine, or in the story of Araki, the Kalandar youth and Hassan the singer. Araki suggests in, in this poem that the critics of his approach do not properly understand the nature of earthly beauty and its spiritual potency in the hands of a Sufi master. To paraphrase the main thrust of lines four to six, Araki gently rebukes these anonymous figures saying, if you knew the secret that I know, you would understand why the real, that is God, is contained in the earthly beloveds described throughout this hagiography. While the nature of the secret is left somewhat vague here, discerning the secret will, he promises, allow them to understand why the real is in the binds of metaphor, or as I actually prefer to translate this term, mad jaws, embodiment. He illustrates this point in the following line, again, through the example of the famous same-sex lovers of Persian literary tradition, Mahmud and Ayaz, cautioning the reader that they will only understand Mahmud's love for his slave, Ayaz, when they come upon it literally experientially, no Bishanasi, the secret in, in love's song. The secret of love and the dance and searching of the lovers and beloveds that it initiates with its tune is that all of existence is, to some extent, the product of one great cosmic love affair. As Sufi love theorists like Araki explain at length in their treatises, love is the origin of everything, and it, and it creates the universe in order to know itself through the love play of beloveds and lovers, ishq bazi. Lovers of all types and stripes, divine, earthly, same sex, and heterosexual alike, participate in this primordial tango whether they are conscious of its metaphysical implications or not. Love excites them to desire through the beauty of their beloveds, igniting the fires of love in the, in the lover's hearts. To Sufis like Araki, the cosmic force of desire drawing lovers to their beautiful beloveds is as real and fundamental to the operation of the universe as gravity, and it can be channeled for unparalleled spiritual advancement on the path of love. Now, let me conclude with a, br with a brief caveat. 
This is a highly simplified and idealized portrayal of this Sufi school of thought. I do not want to leave the impression that I am presenting Persian lands as a great mystic East. I'm certainly not interested in bolstering that Orientalist discourse. Nor am I saying that Sufis and Sufi-inclined rulers who followed this path of love magically became pacifist humanitarians. We know from many historical examples that this indeed was not the case at all. But what I'm trying to showcase here is one of the, per is one of the Persian cultural legacies that flies in the face of the current portrayal of Iran and Persia as an inveterate propagator of death, destruction, and oppression. Far from that, what we see in the Sufi theory of cosmic love is a rich celebration of earthly beauty and love. It understands love as the central force of the universe, and it embraces life in all of its embodied forms for its potential to reveal a new face of the divine at every turn. This worldview is indeed one of the beautiful faces of Persian culture that I wish more Americans could see on a daily basis instead of the usual dehumanizing media portrayals of Iran. Thanks. <laughs>